I'm John Lorden, and I've been looking into mysterious occurrences on my YouTube channel since 2015. Joining me today are some friends from Uncovered.com. I'm Rachel Roslett, a forensic psychologist and head of case research and data at Uncovered. I'm Andrea Cipriano. I'm also a forensic psychologist, and I'm a case researcher and content creator at Uncovered. Welcome back to Lorden Arts Uncovered. And today we're looking into the unsolved case of Teresa Corley. Bellingham is a town in Norfolk County, Massachusetts, sitting on the southwest corner of the metropolitan Boston area. It is currently home to approximately 17,000 people, but today's case took place several decades ago when the population was closer to 13,000. It was 1978. The Bee Gees were topping the charts with hits like Night Fever and Staying Alive, and a new computer program called Email was developed at the University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. TV sets everywhere were playing Three's Company, Laverne and Shirley, and Mork and Mindy. In movie theaters, people were singing to Grease and believing that a man really could fly when watching Christopher Reeve portray Superman. A 19-year-old named Teresa Corley was trying to find her way in the world, but found herself in a terrible situation one fateful night. It seemed like several caring people were helping her along the way, but literally within feet of the local police station, she changed her mind and left. She would later be found murdered. Rachel, Andrea, what do we know about Teresa and how does this timeline come together? Teresa Corley was a determined young woman. Her focus was on her career and where she was going in life. At only 19 years of age, she was already in her second year of Holliston Junior College, and she was studying to be a medical assistant. She had paid her way through school by working part-time at Penthouse Sales, a factory in Franklin, Massachusetts, and they made products like shoes. We know that Teresa came from a big family. She was actually number seven of nine kids who were all girls except for one brother. In high school, she played volleyball and she was part of the drama club. She had dreams of becoming a pediatrician. Before Teresa worked at the penthouse sales, she worked at Star Market. Bob Ward, a coworker at Star Market, now a journalist for Boston 25 News, describes an encounter that he had with Teresa. He says, quote, the last time I remember seeing Teresa Corley, I was working my minimum wage part-time job at Star Market in Franklin, Massachusetts. I was straightening a store shelf in one of the aisles, and Teresa smiled and said hi to me as she passed by, probably on her way to the back room to punch out of her shift at the end of her workday. It's a fleeting memory of a pretty girl full of life who shared a little greeting as she bounced down a supermarket aisle headed to whatever adventure that she awaited. That bright and beautiful young woman that left an indelible mark in Bob Ward's memories would not get to realize her dreams, though. A few months after this encounter with Teresa, Bob remembers learning of her death. He said, quote, a few months later in December of 1978, near the end of a night shift, I remember another Star Market coworker asking me if I had heard the news. She almost couldn't bring herself to say it. She whispered to me, remember that girl, Teresa Corley? She was murdered. Accounts of what happened to Teresa that night are truly horrifying. Absolutely. And I just want to say that anyone that may have issues hearing cases that involve sexual assault, you might want to skip this episode. What this poor girl went through is truly barbaric, and it complicates the understanding and even potential prosecution of this case significantly, which we're going to touch on as, as we go through this. A day before she disappeared, it started out fairly normally. On December 4th, 1978, Teresa left work at Penthouse Sales around 7 p.m. 
She told her mom and her sister, Jerry, that she was going to a friend's birthday party nearby. It's unclear where the party took place or who she, or who she went with, but eventually Teresa leaves the party to go to a bar in Franklin called The Train Stop. She's there hanging out with friends, including her boyfriend, Rick. And we know that while she was there, Teresa got into an argument with her boyfriend and she decided she needed to leave. She asked a friend named Alana to give her a ride home, but Alana declines, telling Teresa that she wanted to stay. So angry, Teresa decides that she will walk home a journey of five or six miles that she would have to navigate on her own in the very early morning hours. I mean, I can't tell you how many cases I look into where this happens. Someone out at a bar with friends separates from them and then takes off alone. It's just super risky. And five or six miles is a couple of hours of walk time out there. Mm hmm. And it happens to both men and, and women that leave bars. Yeah. Um, and it can lead to some really terrible occurrences, as we're about to learn. Somewhere along that walk, Teresa encounters four men who take her to an apartment located at the Presidential Arms in Franklin, Massachusetts. The men have only been identified by their first names, Mike, Steve, David, and John. It's unclear, though, whether Teresa went willingly willingly with them or if she was forced to go there. We're also not sure if these men, one or all of them, were at the train stop bar and they followed her out or if they just spotted her while she was walking along the road. In any case, it appears that the worst happens. It's believed that Teresa is sexually assaulted by at least one of those men in that apartment. Teresa is able to eventually escape the apartment in the early morning hours, and she makes her way down Route 140 to continue her journey home. Teresa is picked up by at least two helpful drivers along the way, most notably a Gerlich Farms truck driver who drops her off right in front of the Bellingham police station. Unfortunately, Teresa does not go into the police station. Now, this is really strange. Like, to think of... Getting a ride with someone, the truck driver taking her to the police station and then her not going in. I, I just I'm wondering, did she ask to be taken to the police station or was she talking in the truck about what she had just been through? Or was it so obvious that she was traumatized that he took her there? It's just it's such a missed moment, like a, everything would be completely different if she goes into the police station at this point. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. she doesn't. And of course, we're talking about someone that's dealing with a sexual assault and the trauma around that. Uh, let's take a quick look at some information on statistics about how often that unfortunately happens and also about the reporting of these cases. Over at NSVRC, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, one in five women will experience a completed or attempted sexual assault during their lifetime. One in five. It's crazy. One in three female victims will have that first assault happen between the ages of 11 and 17. 40% of these assaults were reported to police in 2017, but only about 25% were reported to police in 2018. We're, we're seeing the trend go the wrong way with this. Ladies, what, what are some of your thoughts about why, why the reporting is so low on this? Um, historically, it's been um, a victim blaming crime culture around this crime. Um, it, often women are asked, what did you do to cause these men to attack you? Did you wear inappropriate clothing? Did you flirt with him? Um, and in the case of Teresa Corley here, uh, it's 1978. So I think we're not, we weren't as enlightened or careful as we are now. Um, I would guess that if she would have walked into that police station, there would have been a lot of questions about her behavior, mm. um, which may have, may have led to her not wanting to re-traumatize herself that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know she's hanging out at a bar at some point. So it's, it's right. likely she might be drinking as well. And, you know, or, or the, is the guy sitting at the desk going to say, Hey, you smell like alcohol, you know, get out of here. What are you talking about? 
how do you mm-hmm. even know what what has happened i mean who who knows how that conversation could have gone so yeah and i think and we've mentioned it too that the night that she has already had is something that you you can't even script that it's just so awful and i can really see teresa being afraid of not being believed and then of course like you said we throw in the alcohol in there too and then that just puts in a new a new problem with this mm-hmm. um i could also see a world where teresa's afraid of the judicial process and yeah, you know yeah. you're young and this is happening um and just the fear alone of reporting would probably keep her from doing it oh and going from yeah. a situation like i'm surprised she even got in the trucks i mean thinking about being in an apartment where four men are responsible for keeping you there in some way and one of them is attacking you uh and then to having to rely on other men to get you out of that situation to try to get you closer mm-hmm. to home and then to walk into a police station and to say what you've gone through, like, yeah, the the emotional ties around this very, very strong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just your instinct that you want to get back the control and you feel dirty. You want to go home. You know, she may not have even wanted to go to the police station. I think that's not uncommon to just want the situation to end, to take a shower, start, you know, going forward as if it didn't happen. Yeah. Now, of course, with today's case, we know that she does also wind up murdered. So yes, possibility of some connectivity between these two crimes. Absolutely. Uh, about half or 51.1% of female victims are actually attacked by their intimate partner, but 40.8% mm-hmm. are by an acquaintance. And we really don't know enough about the four men to know if she knew them previously or not. But obviously with these stats, we're still seeing that there's nine or 10% um, for a stranger, someone, someone else to be the attacker here over at psychology today, victims of sexual harassment and assault often delay reporting with only one in five women reporting what it, what has happened. Uh, there are many reasons why women don't report sexual harassment and assault at the scene or the time of the incidents. Women are often too afraid or ashamed to report their experiences from a psychological perspective. These experiences can result in confusion and shock often leading to PTSD. This type of trauma might be internalized as a coping mechanism and can take time to make sense of what has happened. And unfortunately, time is not something that Teresa has a lot of on this night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know that since she didn't go into the police station, um, we need to pick up her trail and, and see where she did go from there. We know that she is later seen in front of a Dairy Queen, which is just about a three or four minute walk down the street from the police station. So at this point, Teresa is less than a mile away from her home and she obviously doesn't make it there. Yeah, let's just retrace the steps really quick uh, so we can give everyone as complete a picture as possible. The bar, it looks like I don't think it's open any longer, but I found references Mm -hmm. to it being on Depot Street. Um, So this is where she starts, probably went up Main Street, probably made a left on Emmons here. Um, And I don't know where she gets picked up by these four guys. I don't know. Are they in a vehicle? But somehow she gets taken pretty much not quite halfway, but a third of the way in the Mm -hmm. direction of her home to the presidential arms building. When I was putting this map together, one of the other, I, I just look at this. Like there's a police department right here, you know, just just, so close to hell. Yeah. To know what's happening. But again, I mean, we know that there's all kinds of different considerations. It's not as easy as walking in, but that's where the nearest police station was for, uh, when she was being attacked. Um, so then we have the, the, uh, Gerlich farms truck driver, I believe actually picks her up close to their location. I think it's right around the front mm-hmm. gates. So this mm-hmm. is where that location is from there takes her to the Bellingham police department. And this one, a little off route, especially if she lives somewhere around the dairy queen up here. Mm-hmm. So this seems to have been. a a thought like, okay, I've got to get her to the police station. Either she's asked for it or he has come to that conclusion, but he's taking her off her intended route a little bit. We know she doesn't go back in. She does continue her way north from here, gets to the Dairy Queen, and then somewhere a mile around this is where she actually lives. 
Um, it, for her to make it that far, like she is really fighting to get back to her home. She's gone five or six miles at this point, almost. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the really gut punches, I think, besides all the things that we see happen to her along the way. But just to know that she was so close. Well, and so honestly... Close. I'm wondering, especially Andrea has come up with a point we'll be touching on later. I'm wondering if she does get home or, or gets within oh, the vicinity possibly. of her house. Um, mm -hmm. cause we know she's, she's awfully close at this point, but unfortunately she doesn't get there. Andrea, tell us where she is eventually found. Yeah. So two days after she was last seen, Teresa's nude body is found on the northbound side of route 495 in Bellingham, Massachusetts. Her jacket and a pair of jeans were found laying next to her, along with a pair of mismatched shoes. Curiously, the man who found Teresa identified himself to police as John Burlington, and he told them that he found her after he pulled over to relieve himself. His body or her body was past a guardrail down in a ditch. Police say that John Burlington turned out to be a fake name. An autopsy is performed on Teresa and it determines that she had been sexually assaulted and then was strangled to death with a thin ligature. I'm just trying to keep all this and get some handle on this. So we have her sexually assaulted at the apartment. Is there a chance that she was assaulted again? Do we know? I, I don't know that we know. Okay. I think we get some clues a little bit later on when perhaps they look at the DNA testing. Um, but I think we can only conclusively say that there was some sort of sexual assault in that apartment with those four men. I mean, it's just, it's mind boggling to me to have someone that experiences something like that, but then they're murdered that same night. I mean, it's like lightning striking twice in the same place. Exactly. Does it happen? Yes. But it's like, how rare is this? Um, mm -hmm. and then if she was actually sexually assaulted a second time as part of the murder, like. This is this is nightmare fuel here. Mm -hmm. um, I know that if this was a current case that we were talking about, if we weren't talking about 1978, I'd certainly be concerned that someone from the apartment got back to her at some point, like use some location tracking on her phone or something like that. But you got to remember in 78, we didn't have cell phones. And being a child of the 80s, mm -hmm. like I remember, you know, um, trying to pick someone up or get picked up from a place. And it, it was a long process, like trying to track down someone in the middle of the night across a six mile stretch without some form of technology, in my mind, next to impossible. So unless there's a mm -hmm. different consideration here that, that I'm missing. And that's where I think Andrea has an interesting point. Yeah, my thinking goes back to what we learned about these four men is that we don't necessarily know when their paths cross. So whether it's at the bar or if it's hitchhiking or something like that. Um, but what we do know is at some point she is in a car with them. And my thinking is more along the lines that it's possible she was trying to hitchhike to get back home. So when these guys do take her into the car, she would have probably immediately said her address or at least like mm. the neighborhood or cross streets by her home and seeing on the map too, we know that their apartments are along the way if you were to go that route. Right. So it's possible they knew her address. So when she does actually escape the apartment, I fear that they were hanging around waiting for her to get home so that they could essentially silence her forever. So no one would know what happened. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's it such... makes sense to me that she would have told them some place to take her right because i doubt she would have gotten in that car unless she thought that they were taking her to where she needed to go well mm -hmm. this kind of leads to another consideration and i know listeners and viewers out there were probably hearing mismatched shoes like how does that happen how she found miss with mismatched shoes the wicked deeds podcast spoke to her sister and the information is that uh there was some shoes that were popular back then that were essentially unisex and she had the same types of shoes as one of the men in the apartment. So seemingly when she was getting her things together and trying to get out of there, she put one of her shoes on and accidentally grabbed one of their shoes and put that on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we have the shoe mismatch. But that also makes me think, did she possibly leave other things behind? Did she leave a purse behind or her ID and that had her home address on it? So we do yes. have 
some mechanisms where they might have been able to reconnect with her. And I know from seeing the kind of social buzz around this case, a lot of people do think that one of the men in that apartment had something to do with, with her demise. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, then it also begs the question, is John Burlington actually a suspect, the guy that, that calls her in? Well, I think that we we find out that he might be. Um, it certainly seems suspect to me that um, someone just happens to be relieving themselves in a strange place and spots a body that's clearly rolled down into a hidden area. Um, and then they call in and give a fake name. I think he would have to be at that point because other. How how would this person have known that Teresa's remains were there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And you know, we know this from looking at many cases. The person who finds the body is always mm -hmm. considered suspicious. So that I think, coupled with the fact that he doesn't give a real name, is is cause for concern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what happens with the investigation at this point? So it starts in December of 1978, but doesn't really go anywhere. We know law enforcement conducted interviews and took the evidence from the scene where she was found. Which it seems more like a dumping spot to me. Like I don't, I'm not hearing enough about the scene to to say that this is where the attack that ended her life took place. Um, it it's so it, it it just always makes me wonder in cases like this when you have a dumping spot, you actually you have the scene of a crime, but it might not be the murder that you're trying to solve. There's very likely another location that's the actual crime scene here and investigators don't have that to work with so how do you figure this out it's just it's challenging right from the start i think it makes it definitely more complex and obviously it, it appeared to affect this case because it would be more than 10 years before there's another big step in the case. Um, and that's when police find and interview an acquaintance of Teresa's named Ronnie. Some people think there's a possibility that Ronnie is the man who identified himself as John Burlington. So a few years later after that, in 1993, an officer uh, meets with Teresa's sister, Jerry, uh, to see if Jerry can identify a jacket and a shoe that they found that may have belonged to Teresa. So then later in April of 2006, officers would interview Ronnie again, asking if he was John Burlington. He denies it, but he does tell police that he has information on Teresa Corley's murder, but he doesn't actually give any of the details. Another missed opportunity here, like just... This mm -hmm. case just has too many of these. It's it's really unsettling. And I don't I don't know that we know enough about what happened for Ronnie to not share that information. And quite honestly, sometimes you'll have people say things like that and they really don't mm -hmm. have any solid info. But uh, his name does come up in this case a few times. And, you know, for officers to get him in a room and say, hey, we want to know if you're if you're John Burlington, like, are you are you the guy? They were obviously um, they, they, they had him in their in their sights. They did, um, but unfortunately, two months after that interview, Ronnie passes away and he takes whatever information he knew about her murder to his grave. In 2015, the Justice for Teresa Corley Facebook page is created by her sister, Jerry, and Jerry continues trying to raise awareness and finding new information about her sister's case. Jerry really is um, a huge advocate and is working so hard for Teresa's case. Um, that same year in 2015, DNA testing is done on the stains from Teresa's genes. And it, in fact, com comes back as a match to one of the men in the apartment, the, the gentleman named David. All right. Well, then we've got some charges, right? We can at least get a charge for sexual assault going, if nothing else. Unfortunately, the district attorney would not charge him as the statute of limitations was up on the sexual assault. Oh, I, I, I believe that's changing nowadays. I think it depends on state. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is 
this case, it just seems like it, it's stymied all along the way. Yeah. Um, but it does get another chance in 2017 when they decide to exhume Teresa's body and see if they can conduct further testing. What they were really hoping to do is to obtain fingernail clippings to see if they could get any DNA and match that. Unfortunately, they were not able to get any DNA evidence from underneath her fingernails. Hmm. Thankfully, there is always new technology coming forward, and one might still be able to help this case. So in 2021, law enforcement told Jerry that they had some items that could be tested using an MVAC retrieval system. Yeah. So in case you're not familiar, we've talked about it a few times on the channel, but uh, MVAC is essentially a system that uses like sterile water and shoots it against a surface, usually like a porous surface. And anything that comes back is then DNA tested. And basically, you know that that DNA came from that object because the water was clean before before it was shot at it. Um, it's it's helped with a few cases in particular where uh, I know the, the popular one they talk about, if you ever go to CrimeCon, you can actually talk to MVAC about this, is where it was used on a rock. Uh, there was a rock that had DNA and they kind of used this system to pull the DNA and, and get a, a read on it. Um, what I'm wondering about in this instance is, are they talking about like the clothing that was found with her? I, I just, I don't know what objects in particular, um, or maybe it was other objects in the scene. Maybe they do have something that they suspect might be the weapon or something that they, they want to mm -hmm. test, but, um, throwing M back at it. I'm, I'm I'd certainly take another shot. This case has so many roadblocks, like take every chance you can with this one. For sure. And it, it's just amazing to me how technology continues to develop that these cases that we think, you know, there's been so many missteps or there's been so many missed opportunities. Um, technology and forensic science really opens another door for um, resolution on this case when we thought it was over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is tricky with like we touched on before, like when you have the sexual assault component, like there's a known sexual yeah. assault that happened earlier. So in terms of DNA, like, you know, the simple places that you would think of for testing DNA and the results that you would get from that don't necessarily bring you to the conclusion about the murderer that that right. could be someone completely different. So, um, that's where that lightning striking twice in the same day is just really, really harming this case and trying to work through that's going to be tough. Yeah. It seems a little unlikely, um, though anything's possible, um, that a different person would have raped her and then murdered her. But, you know, I could see a scenario where Teresa is clearly traumatized from the experience that she just went through in another bad guy comes along and sees an opportunity to take advantage of a young woman in distress and and do what he does and ultimately murders her. Well, and at this point, she's so close to home. Like, you know, yeah. some people might say, oh, look, she's like, she's been sexually assaulted and now she's hitchhiking. You know, she's, she's trying to get home. Um, but if she's seen at Dairy Queen, she's so close to home, the likelihood that she was hitchhiking again from that point, I right. think is practically none she was a 10 minute walk away right, so right um and given what happened to her the previous time from hitchhiking i can't imagine that she would have hitchhiked even this for any amount of distance at this point yeah mm -hmm. one thing thinking about it now as we're talking about it that this idea of it's possibly one of the assaulters who came back um i wonder why they didn't take her clothes and try to you know, destroy them. Like why leave her clothes there? Yeah. Uh, maybe they weren't thinking about DNA and, and leaving biological evidence that just maybe wasn't what was in their mind, but not in 78, you know, but not in you 78, you've yeah. got, um, you've got an item that's left behind that belongs to one of the men though, mm -hmm. which if it's them that, that caught back up with her, why would you leave like your buddy's shoe with her? Like that's, yeah. um, yes. Except that I assume that they're all in a frenzy and yeah. none of them are acting rationally at this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like the only thing they do take with them is the murder weapon. You know, we don't know what that ligature is. 
Right. So that could have been as far as their their brain was going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been over 40 years since Teresa was murdered, and the family still has no answers about who did this to their loved one. Teresa's sister, Jerry, is still waiting on the authorities to provide her with an update on the MVAC testing. Fingers crossed on that one. There have been multiple leads in different directions, but nothing concrete. More than anything, it seems as though the four men from the presidential arms might know more about what happened that night, but they've never been arrested or charged with either sexual assault or murder. If you have any information on the unsolved murder of Teresa Corley, please contact the Bellingham Police Department tip line at 508-657-2863 or the Franklin Police tip line at 508 508- 440-2780, or you can email tips at franklinpolice.com. You can also reach out to the Norfolk County District Attorney's tip line at 617-593-8840. And of course, I'll have all that contact information in the description box down below. Please share this video with any acquaintances that you have in the Massachusetts area and become part of the team that is still looking for justice for Teresa Corley. We will also have a link to the Facebook group started by her sister in that description box below. So please stop by and show her what a caring community we have here. Speaking of caring communities, if you're looking for a space to meet like-minded true crime enthusiasts and advocates while also engaging in case discussions, look no further than the Uncovered community. There you can attend live webinars presented by experts. We even have a space in the community completely dedicated to this series with John Lorden, where we discuss all the cases we've covered in each of the episodes. Regardless of whether you join our community or not, you still have access to the Uncovered database where you can see all of our sources and a full timeline about Teresa's case. If you want to support Uncovered in another way, we also have a merch sale running. You can find the link in the description box below. Thank you, NBC News, Boston 25 News, the Boston Globe, Mass Live, Milford Daily News, the Woonsocket Call, Project Cold Case, the Unsolved No More YouTube channel, the Wicked Deeds podcast, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's case. Also, a big thank you to my friends at Uncovered.com and co-hosts on today's show, Rachel Rosalette and Andrea Cipriano. Please join us again in two weeks as we look into yet another mystery that deserves to be uncovered.